Hello and welcome. Um, I'm Erin Schneider. I am an administrative associate with the North Central SARE program. I also farm in um, South Central Wisconsin. And I am excited for you all to join us with this episode of Farming Matters. I'm also here excited to be here with Marie Flanagan, who is the North Central SARE's communications um, specialist, and she helps produce the show and is here to co-host um, with us today. And I'm here today with Danielle Guerin, who is the um, farmer as well as executive director of Soul Food Project. And she's here to um, share with you all what she's learned and what is she is helping co-create in her neighborhood um, through her, you know, specifically about her farmer rancher grants in the near Northeast Community Supported Agriculture Program. But also, you know, Danielle, you're we're happy to hear you wherever you want to take that story about your grant and what you would offer to other farmers. So thanks for being here. I'm Danielle and I I founded Soul Food Project in 2017. I had just um, returned from Peace Corps serving as a farm and agribusiness advisor and I was finishing up my master's degree in, in nonprofit management and sustainability and sustainable development and so I was really interested in food security and food deserts. And so I kind of realized that like the area I grew up in was a food desert. And I was very lucky as a child to always be part of a two car household. So I never struggled with food access and getting and get, having food access. We always had a car, we drove to the grocery store. Um, so I moved back home. I was just like, yes, I am starting a farm. And everyone had pretty much told me that like it was the worst idea possible to start a farm in our neighborhood that um, the neighbors would not support it, would not come out to support it. They wouldn't care. The price would be too high. Like it's some, yeah, they wanted food, but they just wouldn't, it's in the neighborhood for that you would have an organic farm in. Like that's what I was told by everybody. And I was just like, well, that makes no sense. I'm going to prove everyone wrong and still do it. And so I found, found this selfie project in 2017 and our mission is to foster wellness in our community by increasing access to local food and offering hands-on educational opportunities. Um, so I chose this as a mission because I want to increase the, the wellness community through our through soul food and things like that. We're called soul food because um, while well, I know like food feeds your soul and like and like different ways you can do that feed your soul, but also education feeds your soul as well. And so for the soul food project because we're feeding, we're feeding community soul through um, food and educational opportunities. And so that's kind of what we started with. And we started farming in 2017 and just building up those sites. We have three sites in the city now. Not, um, and we just kind of, I just kept growing and adding more sites because I needed more space to grow food because um, people were wrong. They, people were supporting, they were wanting food, but people were still being kind of being naysayers and saying, hey, like, it's not really going to work. Like, they're not going to support you fully all the time. It's not going to be sustainable. And so I decided to get a SARE grant. I wanted to see, like, whether, like, a, a farmer's market or a, like, CSA was more economically viable in our neighborhood. And, like, I wonder, like, what, because everyone's saying you can't do either, but I was just like, well, maybe you can do one. Like maybe one, maybe a function doesn't work or a market doesn't work, but maybe like a CSA does work. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, I was increasing our access to local food and offering educational education. That's kind of where the CSA came came out of play because with the CSA, I can do like educational opportunities, also increase access to local food. And so that's what the SARE grant was helping with helping me do and research and figure out like how how it can happen. And so. When I launched the CSA, we had the very first year, we only had what, I think seven members the first season. And it was a 12 week CSA, like every other week as well, um, seven members. Year two, we launched it. We had 10, we had 10 members that year, but it grew to 12. And this is year three of our CSA. And we're up to like 35 members of our CSA in the neighborhood. Um, and so we've, and we've had like different things down and now it's, and now it's a 20 week CSA. So now it starts in May 19th and like generally mid-May and then it goes into October 
Um, and then we have our, so our flyer we did, I made for, the, for that, and we passed out to neighbors with a QR code to purchase a share and then websites and where to pick it up at. Um, and now like our goal is to get to 65 shares like next year. Um, so, and we're, it's possible because we're growing a lot now that we had our three sites. It just put a high tunnel Tuesday at our farm. So <laughs> I'm really excited about that. So we have a high tunnel now and we have a greenhouse too as well. So like we're just expanding a lot. And so with our CSA, we do give them like a weekly newsletter with their, which telling them what they get in their CSA each week. And they also get recipes for the items that they're getting. So they can kind of use those recipes to do different things. And we also sent them this guide to storing food um, for the, them to use at each beginning of the season. And that kind of shows them how to best store their, the produce that they're getting from us because we give so much and they're always just like, that's a lot. How do I keep this last? And so we heard that having an idea how, how to store it was the best way to do it. So we created a guide for them to store the food, like where they can store the tomatoes and different things like that. So it's kind of helps them follow. Um, we're turning into a magnet this year, I think, because to pass out, say people put in their fridges. So it's more accessible and beautiful instead of having to print off themselves or be a magnet for your fridge. So I'm really excited about that. But yeah, we just kind of like the CSA was just made because I felt that that was the best way for us as a, as a nonprofit organization to like actually um, grow community as well, grow community because we are a nonprofit and our sites are all in neighborhoods. Like we are surrounded by houses on all, all of our farm sites are. So like we are, we're neighbors as well. And so we, the CSA helps us to engage with community that way and help us help them have educational as well and it helps us to serve in a way that I feel like really happy about serving in that, in that direction and so with our project it's shown to us that like the neighborhood will support these types of projects and like especially the neighborhoods that are considered low income or like get prominently black neighborhoods they will support these projects if you say it a certain way so I call it a veggie box. I don't really call it a CSA. I call it a veggie box um, because it's more palatable that way. And that, that makes sense. People are like, oh, a veggie box subscription. I know what that is. But when you say CSA, it means it has to get to go. Do you know what that stands for? And then explain what it is. And that's just a lot more. But if you're saying a veggie box subscription, then they it's more open for people to understand it. And also I accept a lot of different payment plans as well. We do payment plans. We do a sliding scale. Um, we do... We accept SNAP for it as well. And we're actually, um, the health department actually is partnering with us for next year to offer another different, better deal for half off for SNAP participants who want to buy our CSA next year. And you mentioned like, you know, your first year, can you talk a little bit about like how, how you went about like, you know, just getting the word out as well as like finding neighbor, you know, finding like, where to farm too, like like getting like land access in your neighborhood to do that. Like I feel like that those are big hurdles. And how did it go for you? Yeah, yeah. So land access for me is I'm like I feel like I'm like the like odd one out for land, with land access because I don't have trouble finding land. Like land finds me in a way. <laughs> so like the our first site, I like I searched for someone to like looking for the property. Like I need property to find this property to grow in my first garden. And then someone had said like, we have this community garden space that we're not using. Like, do you want to use it? And that's how I got that for our first site. And then within a couple of months, I like Purdue Extension reached out to me and was just like, we know another site that needs help, he'll help managing their garden. Do you want to take over that site as well? And I was like, sure. So I had those two sites within the first year, then like by like 2020, I was at capacity and then like our newest site we just we were working on right now my family actually owns and they pretty much were kind of like we teach your capacity we have this plot of land that we're just cutting the grass on do you want to farm on there too and I was like sure <laughs> so like I don't really have trouble finding like getting land access there people just ask me that they're like how do you find land and I'm just like it kind of just finds me and he would just ask and then with getting the word out for our first year we did a lot of Facebook ads and like neighborhood association groups, um, emailed them, and then just like talk to people about it and just like spread the word that way that we were, it was happening. We were, already, we were already doing like at that point, had already been doing farmer's markets. So we had like a, already a small like customer base already. So we had, we, I sent a newsletter out to those customers saying, we're starting a CSA next year. Like that's what we're doing. 
Um, so they knew already and just kind of like shared it that way. And that was how we first started. Yeah. I noticed on your logo that the word youth comes before food. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about why youth are so important for your organization? I think they're they're important for us because like I'm I feel like as a younger as a younger person who was starting a farm um I started when I was like I was 26 27 I started um and I'm just fresh from the city and like there was a lot of doubters with me and stuff and so a lot of people doubt it and doubted that I could do it that it was like oh you, you don't have the experience you never you never done a farm before like I worked on farms but I like, didn't do a full season before I started our farm and so like they were always a lot of people doubted me with that and our youth program kind of started the same year as our farm so like, it was kind of something that was like that was given to me too when I acquired that second site that year they had a youth program happening and they kind of were like with this site comes this youth program <laughs> that you're going to manage too and so that kind of just like came as part of who we were when we first started we were always a farm plus this youth program and they're important to us because they do a lot of the heavy lifting in the, in the year like like when I'm I'm typically I'm not I was a solo farmer up until this year now I have employees and stuff but for the first like four years like I it was just me like plus the teens out at the farm and doing all of this and growing all the food and harvesting. So they're just like a really important part of it. And the skills they're learning and the lead and this and become the leaders they're becoming in the community are really important. And so like we're developing leaders, we're not developing farmers. Um that's how I say this. Like they, they want to farm, they can farm, but like they're gonna be community leaders when, when they're done with when they're done with me. And so that's kind of how I father they're, they're father first because food is important, but that's not all we do and that's not everything that we are. And like when I measure our success, like I don't measure how much food I grew this year anymore. That's just not how much success anymore. I measure everything else I do, all the impacts I'm having as well. So we have the youth are, and they're all W-2 employees. Um, so something I'm big about is equ equity and the food system. And so everyone's a W-2 employee. Um, the starting pay for the youth workers are is $10 an hour, um, what they're making. Um, and so yeah, they're, w they're employees. Um, so they get their set hours each week and then in the summer. And then, so they're the ones up until 18 years old. After you turn 18 and you're still into it, you still want to farm. So you're like, oh, I want to farm more. We just launched our apprenticeship program, which is a year long apprenticeship program for the farm. We will have three spots open at the moment, but yeah, well, they're, they're full, but yeah. And that's what we do for the adults or 18 or older who want to learn how to farm and really get dive more into like the whole farming thing and like running a farm. They pretty much just like follow me around every day and just kind of learn, do everything I do. and. <laughs> MC and get that experience. One question I have, and maybe other farmers might be curious about as well, is like, how do you, how did you arrive at that kind of sweet spot with different payment options for veggie box subscriptions? And then how did you kind of say no to people who found you that were outside your neighborhood, kind of, or just like exploring that space a little bit? Um. Well, I don't say no to people outside the neighborhood. Oh. Um, I, but I do don't, I don't offer them the discounts though, ever. Like, so I, if they are outside the neighborhood and I know where they live, if I don't, they don't tell me and then I just like, well, I just kind of figure it out. But like most people outside the neighborhood, I just don't offer them the discount. And so they get, they pay the full price, so like the $400 for the share. Um, if, but for, I came up with the prices. So I actually was looking at, um, Soul Fire Farm did a SARE project as well on like CSA boxes. So I definitely referenced them a lot when I came to like decide figuring out prices and things of that nature. But I just kind of like looked at the price of like the box, what it was valued at. And then, then I just worked it backwards. And then I, well, I figured out the price of the box was valued at with $400. And then I figured out the lowest I could accept for like the C for the SNAP benefits though. It's just like that made it make sense financially that well, they were still getting a really good deal and I figured out that price. And then I just kind of in between made little notches. So we have like our snap share is like 150. And then our low income share is 200. And then our medium income share is, I think it's, it's 250. Then high income is like 300. And then like 400 is like the solid, it's kind of like a solidarity share. Like, you know, you can pay a four, 400, what you're gonna pay. And you can pay, you can afford to pay and have pay a little extra. And so that's kind of how I came up with the prices and just kind of just figured out the differences that way and how much, how it made sense and was easy enough to like do like the weekly purchases too, because with SNAP benefits, they can't pay all of it up front. It's not allowed. 
they have to pay it day of. And so I had to figure out a good number that they could use to like, that works out for them. They can easily remember, remember the amount and it wouldn't be a weird number after 20 weeks like that they're paying. I think um, I would add that anyone who was like interested in doing a CSA could like to remember that first word is community. Remember that that what that means and to try not to like do things to the community, but do things with the community. And I'm wondering if you've had to tackle any concerns around soil health or soil quality, given the fact that you've got urban lots. Yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I, our first site is like was pretty good easily. It was a house that was there, but like the soil tested, it was fine, no heavy metals. Um, our newest site where the high tunnel is and things like that are just our biggest site um, definitely actually has lead in the soil. Um, we I knew about it. There was like a, a lead plant burnt, burnt down in like the 70s in the neighborhood. And so all the lead soil in that neighborhood has been like contaminated and the EPA has come through and fixed a lot of the residential areas. But if they were vacant lots, they were kind of like, well, it's just vacant lot. We don't have to fix this. Um, so no one's living here. So they are that site still has um, this lead in the soil. Um, I had the option of getting them to like come in and, and remediate it for me. But then it was just like, would have put us back a season on using that site. And so I was just like, nope, not gonna do it. So I just built up. Um, and so we've added uh, about a foot of mulch onto one site. And now this high, this high tunnel is, we're gonna add another like foot of mulch in the high tunnel. We're actually gonna put fabric down first under the high tunnel and then add mulch on top of the fabric, then, add, then build the beds on top of the mulch just to be on the very safe side that nothing you grow in there will hit that lead. Um, but we've, I worked a lot with Purdue University um, this past two years, putting a trial on carrots um, and how carrots operate in soils with heavy metals. And so we've been planting a lot of carrots at my farms the past two years <laughs> through Purdue University, <laughs> just a uh, test, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's been fine. They haven't, they haven't pulled up any, they haven't reached down to the native soil yet to pull out. So we're pretty, I'm pretty happy that we can maybe eventually at our main site, um, we'll be able to get like, start growing more root crops at that site. Like there's some things that are really unique to an urban farm area than like kind of more rural or peri-urban space that you have to tackle as well. Like, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't have like, none of our sites have like water on their actual site. Um, so the one that I'm at right now, like I live next door to it. So we run the water from my house to, to the site next door. Um, our main site, that that like I call our main site on Sheldon, I we run the water from across the street to this to the farm. And the other side, third side, they have a building like further away that we run the water to. It's like we connect like five hoses together to get water to that site to water it. Um, so yeah, water is definitely an issue. Um, we, I am going to get water installed on our biggest site with a high tunnel list because it's just like now with the high tunnel there and all the there's like 25 beds there then plus the high tunnel now. Um, so we just need like consistent water access. So like that's our next thing is like getting water installed. What's kind of next in, in store in the season ahead for like for your personal food project? What's <laughs> happening next? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, we just built our high tunnel on Tuesday. Um, so that just got like literally all the entire day up in a day. It's great. Um, and so we're going to work on building out those beds this next couple of weeks. Um, and then we're going to just try to like get some stuff in the ground in the high tunnel and we're going to try to grow all winter inside. Um, I may do like a salad CSA um, this winter. Um, that's how I feel on just growing. Um, but like that is kind of like farm wise, that's kind of the goal. We're slowing down a little bit for the season, but not really because I just, I want to be like one of the only like year round nonprofit farms in the city. Um, a lot of the farms a lot of the farms slow down, they stop growing in the winter time because it's just hard to be sustainable and financially sustainable unless you're like a for-profit farm. And so I want to try to, my goal is to us to become that one with the first financially sustainable like nonprofit farm this year round. Tuck Farm is around the corner from one of our sites. And so they've like, a lot of the, a lot of their employees joined our CSA this year because they like, we, they can walk from off in the office, pick up their share and like, they can take a little afternoon break. And so, now that they're really involved in what we do, they have a program where they, at farmer's markets, they do like, if you have fresh SNAP, you do the Fresh Bucks program, so that you have SNAP, they'll match you up to $20. You use $20 in SNAP and, and food stamps. And so they're trying to figure a way that they can incorporate that into our CSA program. So 
they can get more people who are on SNAP to um, be able to purchase and for the CSA shares and be sustainable that way. And so that is kind of our goal right now. Um, I am probably going to find a third site, a fourth site soon. Um, I want an orchard. I don't have, like, we don't have any, like, a lot of fruit. And so I think I want to have a fourth site where I can have at least some trees out there and get some fruit going for us. So can- Much abundance to you and your neighbors and community and with the season ahead. And I know um, the dormancy months, for lack of a better word, but it sounds like you're, <laughs> you've got plans to keep the season going year round. So that's great. And just wishing, yeah. you, wishing you much much good cheer for that so thank you